put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Let me introduce you again to my friend Francois Duplessis. Francois and I have known each other for over 20 years, and he's going to talk today about Anken Sempaten. Now, this was a very interesting lady, and he's going to take us to Tel El Armana. Francois. Thank you. Walter, you were a skeptic some time ago, I believe, because you didn't have the facts. People were skeptic about the existence of the Hittites because there were no facts, except the Bible. Who wants to believe this old book? This is exciting. Well, God cares about skeptics. So the archaeology, the science of archaeology was born. And then the discoveries came. Now, the first monotheistic pharaoh lived here at Tel El Amarna, as, as Walter mentioned, and he believed in Ma'at, truth, the whole truth. Truth is never popular. Now, I visited his tomb, the only one on the eastern side of the Nile, because he didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. He believed in the person who sleeps after death. He read the story of Job. Uh, here you can see a picture of the family, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and some of their daughters, Mekitaten, Meritaten, Nefernefroaten, and then Anken Senpaten. She later married Tutankaten. All ends in A-T-E-N, referring to the fact that they were monotheists. Now, it's interesting to visit the, the tomb of Tutankhamun, as well as his treasures in the Cairo Museum. This is the death, ma death mask of the man. Now, in the year 1887, you're looking at a woman to tell Ella Marna, a peasant woman discovered 400 tablets inscribed in Akkadian cuneiform. Well, you can read them in the uh, Louvre Museum nowadays. Here's an example of one. For the first time, archaeologists found the name of the Hittites on these clay tablets. So the skeptics, God provides for skeptics. Here's the proof. And uh, you're looking at Hattusas, the, the capital of the Hittites. Hugo Winkler, a German archaeologist, in the year 1908, discovered a published letter by Mursilis, his son. And this is what the letter reads. People say that you have many sons. Give me one of your sons, and he is my husband and king in the land of Egypt. This email came from Anken St. Parton. And the king opened his computer and he read this. Well, uh, Supi Luli Omas, this uh, king from Atusas, besieged Kalkemish, and uh, for a year he ignored the email from Anken Sen Amun. On his way to Tel El Amarna, he was killed. Francois, may I interject? Why yeah. is she now Anken Sen Amun when she was Anken Sen Paten before then? She had the truth, the whole truth. But to be popular in those days, you had to become a polytheist. And uh, she changed the name to Anken Sen Amun. Amun was the main god in the pantheon of Egyptian gods. She lost truth and she changed it for the lie. Now, this is the tomb of I, who eventually married Anken Sen Paten. Uh, Anken Sen Amun asked the greatest king of the ancient world to give her his son to marry. Disappointments. Have you had a love relationship, a disappointment? You know, Supi Luli Umas delayed one year before he answered Anken Sen Amun's email. Her future husband was murdered. And then she had to marry someone she didn't love. Did this happen to you? You know, we can contact God telling him that we want his son to come into our lives to be our partner. He will respond immediately. This is the good news of the gospel. 
I spoke to her image, a statue in the Karnak temple, and I said, Ankin Senamun, your dreams of marrying a young prince were shattered. He never reached you. But there is another prince, Jesus Christ, who never disappoints. He always responds to the call of the lonely, empty heart. God bless you. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to talk about mammals. Now mammals are the latest of the arrivals on the evolutionary time scale, according to the scientific fraternity. And we're dealing with the last 60, 40 million years of time. Smaller mammals were there before then, but the real mammal explosion we find in the upper layers of the geological column. And we find these amazing creatures. And they're situated up here in the tertiary layers, right up there. We find the mammalian explosion. And so it is assumed that because they appear in the upper echelon of the geological column, that is when they evolved. Now, of course, they do also occur lower in the geological column, together even with the period of the dinosaurs. So this is not strictly speaking true. There are other explanations also why they could be at the top and not at the bottom, because this scale of fossilization may not be related to time as much as it is related to events, such as flood events, catast catastrophes, animals float, some float, some don't. And there are many reasons as to why we can get a sequence which does not necessarily reflect the sequence in time. But nevertheless, the mammals are there at the top of the geological column. Again, if you look at the fossil assemblages, you find some amazing features. For example, here in the British Museum, they have this amazing exhibit of this fascinating fossil, and the inscription reads, Mammal Graveyard. The fossilized remains of an antelope, a gazelle, a horse, a carnivore, are preserved in the slab. The fossils are surrounded by floodplain deposits, suggesting that the animals were swept together by torrential floods. There is no weathering and little damage to the fossils, so they must have been buried quickly. It's amazing. When you go to the Karoo assemblages, you find the same thing. When you go to the Morrison, you find the same thing. When you come to the mammals, you find the same thing. But nobody accepts a universal flood as a possibility as to why these animals were all buried in torrential floods. Obviously, this is not a harmonious fossil assemblage, so it must have been a catastrophe where the animals were washed together. We also find in the upper layers bone fragments en masse, like here in these tertiary deposits, all these little bone fragments showing that some of the animals must have been churned in this process. Some of them may have been floating and rotting and then buried in a subsequent turbidite. So this shows an abnormal situation. Not your millions of years of chance fossilization here and there, but catastrophe. And that's exactly what the Bible would describe. We find fossil graveyards such as these. Now surely this is not slow fossilization chance fossilization over long periods of time. It smacks of catastrophism. In fact, that's the only logical conclusion one can come to. People will say these animals lived in the floodplains. But like I said before, floodplains stretching over hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, highly unlikely. It takes a stretch of the imagination. But here we have sea urchins buried together under the oceans. So again, floodplain deposits under the ocean. These were turbidites. These were catastrophes taking place even at the level of the sea and under the sea. Well, here we have a look at some of the marine mammals that we find. They're an interesting misnomer in the evolutionary time scale. These creatures appear suddenly. And the older paleontological textbooks will admit this quite freely. The, the newer ones uh, change the nuance and hide it in paleontological jargon. But the fact is, these animals appear instantly. Now, isn't it fascinating? 
that these animals should have been derived from land animals because the mammals evolved on land. See, the scenario goes that the, the animals, the fish, first started to encroach upon the land, then the amphibians, then the reptiles, and out of these, the mammals developed. And now the mammals were land creatures, so how come we have all these marine mammals? Well, the theory then goes they secondarily re-entered the watery areas. So, for example, we have hippopotami, which uh, are water-living creatures, and so the assumption is that similar land eutherian mammals secondarily encroached in the marine environment and then populated it. But now, Imagine the change that must have taken place from animals that walk on all fours with tails and structures suited to land environments. They have to return to the waters, lose all those anatomical features, develop a totally different musculature, a totally different physiology in terms of breathing, a total revamp physiologically, anatomically, an entire reconstruction of the creature without leaving a trace in the fossil record. Surely that doesn't make much sense. Here we have marine mammals. Each of them we find in the fossil record already fully established as we have them here. The cetaceans, the marine mammals, the giant mammals, when they occur in the fossil record, there they are. Of course, there were other creatures living in the sea which don't live there now, which is part of the extinction scenario. The largest mammals, the largest creatures that ever lived are these giant marine cetaceans like the whales. And uh, the ancestral story becomes very, very intriguing. There has to be a link between creatures that had legs and creatures that do not have legs. And so this is the supposed ancestral link. Some 10 million years ago, back to 60 million years ago, they had a hypothetical mesenchyme skeleton down here, for example. Now notice the word hypothetical. What does that tell you? It tells you that they don't have the fossil, right? Now if you go a little bit higher, you have Ambulocetus over there, a creature with uh, legs and hind limbs. And if you go a little bit higher, then you have the modern toothed whales, etc. So this is the scenario from a hypothetical creature these evolved. Now there must be some concrete creature somewhere that you could pin this to. Well, one that they tend to use is Pachycetus. It's a land mammal reconstructed from a jaw and some skull fragments. So there is no real evidence as to what the whole creature looked like or whether it swam or whether it didn't swim. Ambulocetus had hind limbs, was obviously able to walk, and it needs very imaginative reconstruction to even attempt linking it with whales. Another creature at the bottom, a Basilosaurus, a serpentine creature, was not related to whales, but is sometimes used as a possible uh, intermediary. These were creatures in their own right, had nothing to do with whales, but there is nothing else left. They will talk about varieties that you have, for example, a shift in the respiratory opening that you find in whales. Well, you have varieties of, of positions even today. That's natural variability in the gene pool. Now, Charles Darwin speculated that bears gave rise to whales because bears like to swim in water. He conjectured that they somehow lost their legs and eventually, over millions of years, turned into whales. The trouble is, all these creatures appear in the same fossil assemblages at the same time, the same time scale, with no evidence of this large-scale anatomical change. They will talk of little bone fragments representing ancient hips in some of the fossil finds. These bone structures occur in modern whales, but they serve a purpose. They are not uh, structures that resemble something that existed in the past. They are necessary today. They are there for muscle attachment. They serve a purpose. They're not a relic of evolutionary processes. Here is a study that was done at uh, La Malinda University on some of the, the whales in diatomaceous sediments in Peru that were found. And what is interesting is that we find these whales in the fossil assemblages as fully articulated, absolutely intact. 
Now, what does that tell us? This tells us that this creature, or this huge number of creatures, because there are whales lying all over in this particular scenario. There's one over there, there's one over here, and uh, various ones lying in close perimeters. All of these whales must have been buried instantly. Now think about that. What buries a whale instantly if it isn't a mega catastrophe, a mega mudslide such as we do not see in today's world? Here are modern whale carcasses. They become disarticulated very rapidly, but these fossil finds are fully articulated, showing a totally different environmental circumstances. When they lie under the sea, they also become disarticulated very rapidly. So this must have happened instantly. Again, there is a pointer to catastrophism and not long periods of time. Well, let's turn to some other fossils. Here we have a fossil bat. Now, the interesting thing about fossil bats is that they're very large, larger than anything that we find today. Now, does that make them primitive or does that make them advanced? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Primitive or advanced? Well, they're exactly the same as modern bats. There's no anatomical difference in terms of their skeletal structure. And when they appear in the fossil record, they are fully formed. There are no half bats, quarter bats, three quarter bats, fully formed. So surely this points to creation rather than to evolution over time. Now when you turn to the textbooks of the mammalian periods where the mammals reigned, you will find these interesting pictures of these huge creatures so very different from what we find today. And uh, the idea is posted in the mind that the world millions of years ago was very different to what it is today. So, for example, you will have the giant mastodons roaming the earth, the giant sloths, the saber-toothed tigers, and it is, it is made to appear as if this was the world then and what we have today is a totally different world. Well, in actual fact, that's not true at all. Because when you had the saber-toothed tiger, you had tigers with normal teeth as well. That was the range that you had, the variability in the gene pool. And over time, that variability was reduced. That is not evolution. That is particularly interesting in terms of change over time, rapid or slow. Obviously, the entire gene pool accommodates everything from small teeth to large teeth. And then by natural selection, which is a process, eliminating the less fit, which I don't have a problem with, except in terms of making it a progenitor of new forms of life. It's just sorting out what is already there. So these are unfair conjectures as far as I'm concerned. Let's go to the top pits of the world. This is Libri. Notice the bubbles rising from the tar pit, which shows that gases are still escaping from these tar pits, which means that if they were millions and millions and millions of years old, surely the fermentation processes involved in the creation of these uh, pits should have been completed many million years ago. Uh, these Coke bottles should have been flat by a long time. So what happened here? Creatures approached these, these tar pits, thought they were areas of water. Some of them encroached into them, and then they got sucked in by the process. In their, in their fear, they cry out, predators come, and then they show at these pits how these saber-toothed tigers came along and ripped into them, and eventually they became subject to the same demise, and so in these tar pits, we find these beautifully preserved skeletons of this giant mastodon. Now, think for a moment. A giant mastodon, is it a primitive relic of something that was so different in the past to what it is today? Or is it just a giant elephant? Surely, it's just a large creature, just as complex and advanced as anything that exists today, just larger. If we go to the giant sloths, 
These creatures over here, which we don't have around today anymore, are depicted as being ancient. Now, when I was lecturing in this subject, I used to show the students at the university the Life on Earth series. And in one of these series, they have the story of this giant sloth, and it really, it really amazed me, because they found skins of these creatures still intact on some of the haciendas in South America. So how old can these creatures really be? if some of these creatures are found with fully intact skins. Surely we're not talking millions. There are even some that feel that these creatures are alive today and uh, plan exhibition or, or expeditions to go and find them. Well, here's the skeleton of a giant sloth. And uh, that's an actual life-size uh, replica outside in the yard at Labri. So you can imagine, these creatures were very large. But as I say, the skins of them are still intact today. By the way, you find the same thing with the giant kangaroos in Australia. You find skeletons with skins intact. And they say, yes, but this is because uh, the oxygen was different in the caves over millions of years. Over millions of years, I don't buy that too readily. And by the way, things change in caves as well. Giant bisons, what is the, the watchword we're talking about? Giant sloths, giant elephants, giant bisons. That sounds like devolution over time rather than evolution. As I have uh, shown you before, these beautiful creatures, the saber-toothed tiger, they have a, a list of them or a whole uh, exhibition of these in Labrie, and you will see that the tooth size ranges to smaller than present-day tigers, to the extreme of the range, the saber-toothed tiger length. Now, is it fair to represent the one extreme as the norm? That doesn't make sense to me. You should take the middle of the road. So here we have a modern tiger and a saber-toothed tiger next to each other. And uh, obviously, a creature with such long teeth would eventually be at a selective disadvantage, and the extremes of the range would be cut off. But what would you be left with? you'd still be left with tigers. Here is a dire wolf. Again, the watchword is giant dire wolf. Now let's have a look at these interesting creatures that were frozen in time. We have a scenario in the world out there that the world was subject to various ice ages over millions and millions of years of time and that these ice ages lasted for some 100,000 years. Now, there are so many theories regarding ice ages that it boggles the mind. And there's a very simple reason for this. If you want to have an ice age encroach upon the Earth over a long, long period of time, let's say hundreds of thousands of years or 100,000 years or any long protracted period of time, you're going to run into a problem. And this is the problem. As it gets colder, you have less evaporation. As you have less evaporation, you have less precipitation. And if you have less precipitation, then you cannot have glacial advance over thousands of years. So you have a thermodynamic problem in this whole theory of prolonged, protracted ice ages. So there's another way of looking at ice ages. And this is that they were short, fast, and had different reasons for their occurrence. Maybe there was just one ice age rather than three or four or five, as the scientific world proposes. Now, why do they propose more than one ice age? Because they find these scratches in the rocks. Now, we know that these scratches can be caused by rolling sediment in mud flows. So catastrophism can produce those same scenarios instantly without having to revert to hundreds of thousands of years of time. So let's have a look at these creatures. Now, the mastodons roamed the Earth some 40 million years ago. Now, previously, scientists put these creatures way back into the past many millions of years ago as a strange phenomena in the evolution 
of mammalian life. And uh, as they got frozen, some of the pictures depict wolves and other creatures. Of course, in the ice, you have all kinds of creatures that are trapped there, and not only cold-adapted creatures, which is, which is rather strange. Beavers, for example, all kinds of creatures uh, in these ice beds. Now, here we have a dig where they're digging up these particular creatures in the ice. And the interesting thing is that the meat is still intact. If you go to Alaska and there is a big thaw, and as we are warming up at the moment in a, in a warming phase, the thaw becomes more and more, so the aroma becomes more and more. In other words, these things are still rotting. The animals can still partake of the flesh of some of these creatures as they are being unearthed. So my question is this. How many millions of years have they been lying there if uh, they're still edible to some? Here they are digging up some of the remains of these giant mastodons of the past. Here's a mastodon embryo that was found. Here is an uh, ice cone. And this is used as evidence for very, very long time periods. But they could be event periods. You see, each one of these ice cones has rings on it. And these rings that we find over here on this cone are supposed to be year indicators. And you can count them and you can get to many, many, many layers. And therefore, it is supposed that this happened over you know, very long time periods. However, there are also cases of aeroplanes that uh, made crash landings on these Nordic northern islands and that were buried in snow and they have many layers above them, far more than the years indicate. So these could be event layers, a snowstorm, a thaw, whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to depict long ages of time. In fact, when you go to the glaciers of the world that are supposed to be relics of ice ages lasting hundreds of thousands of years, here, such as at Athabasca Glacier, it is found that these glaciers advanced and are receding far faster than the scientific world ever anticipated. These glaciers are in a giant melt at the moment, and here you have the year signposts of where the glaciers were in the past. And so the scenario is that complete glaciation, instead of lasting hundreds of thousands of years, could have taken place in a few hundred years. That really cuts the geological time scale down tremendously. Yes, there were ice ages. We have lots of evidence of glaciation. The question is, over what time period did they take place? Here we have some beautiful glacial lakes in the north of Canada. Now, what could have changed that produced this southern climatic alteration on the planet? Well, some conjecture that uh, meteors struck the planet. And this is also one of the theories that is used for the extinction of the dinosaurs, although the dinosaurs are lying in watery mass graves. But let us have a look at this possibility. We find a lot of meteor impacts on the surface of the Earth. And this could have produced tremendous volcanism. Here we have the great Arizona crater, there are huge mega craters in Siberia, along the coast of Africa, and so the Earth was subjected to a period of bombardment. Well, this would have produced tremendous volcanism. Now, a volcano spews out ash and uh, gases, and these can shield solar radiation. One volcano, Mount St. Helens, for example, reduced the average temperature of the Earth quite considerably, and uh, a large one like Krakatoa can do so even more. Now, during this period of volcanism, we might have had up to 80,000 volcanoes exploding in the Ring of Fire, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, all of these areas, and we find a lot of evidence for volcanism right on top, like here we have them in uh, Washington State, for example. And this could indicate a period of shielding. Here we have dikes within the, the rocks showing a period of tremendous volcanism. The ring of fire, 
St. Helens eruption, all of this dust shielding the solar radiation and causing a tremendous drop in temperature. So you could have had a rapid ice age and it didn't have to necessarily take place over millions of years. Now, we have to look at the transition from all of this mammalian evolution into the evolution of man. And we will continue with this after a short break. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. We were talking about the dawn of man, the last little cherry on top of the evolutionary advance from the simple mammals up to this bipedal intelligence roaming the planet. Now, the evidence that is presented seems so overwhelming that there really is all this evidence for evolution. When on the other hand, you read between the lines, there is no such evidence, absolute evidence. Here's an interesting cave drawing. It's a cave drawing of a mastodon. Now, this presents a problem, because remember, on the evolutionary time scale, these creatures existed eons, millions and millions of years ago, and then went extinct and gave rise to the more modern creatures that we have today, many millions of years later. But if they are cave drawings of this creature, then obviously man and these creatures must have been contemporaneous. We also find interesting phenomena of human spearheads and things like this in some of these creatures. So surely man and these creatures were contemporaneous. Now you have a, you have a problem. Do you take the dawn of man back or do you bring the end and the demise of the mastodons forward? Well, you don't want to take man back. That wouldn't fit the evolutionary time scale. After all, we're the cherry on top, right? So you have to bring the other one forward. So it's easy to adapt when the evidence demands an adaptation. But nobody would go so far as to say that, well, maybe they were all there at the same time. Let's have a look at the dawn of man. Here we have these typical depictions of modern humans and their evolutionary advance from a somewhat uh, quadrupedal walk to a bipedal walk. And uh, one of my colleagues at my university, one of my universities, actually went public on, a, on a, a radio interview saying that the apes came down from the trees when the trees became less abundant owing to climate changes, where you went from these arboreal or tree-living environments to grasslands. And then these creatures walked in the grass and they had to go on their hind legs to look over the top. And this is how the upright gate eventually evolved. Now that's not even Darwinism, that's Lamarckism. That is wishful thinking. Do birds fly because they have wings or do they have wings because they fly? Obviously, they fly because they have wings. Otherwise, we could flap around and hope to fly, and eventually we would, right? It doesn't happen like that. That's Lamarckism, and that was debunked many, many years ago. So none of this happened. If anything must have happened, there must have been a variety, some more upright than others, and had a selective advantage, etc. Nevertheless, the idea is they came down from the trees into the grassland situation, they not only changed their mode of locomotion, they also changed their diets because now all of a sudden they became hunters and they became carnivores when before they seemed to be quite happy with leaves and bananas. How man began. These are Time magazine issues showing the dawn of man and it seems to me that every few years they have this slogan, just in case people might forget where we come from. How man began, fossil bones from the dawn of humanity. And then, how man began, amazing discoveries 2.5 million years ago. But please note what these creatures look like. They don't look like modern man. And uh, the one on the left over here 
He has a couple of cuts and bruises and scars because, you see, evolution is a process of violence. You have to overcome the odds in order to rise to the top of the evolutionary tree. And so death and fitness and survival are part of the equation. So they're always depicted as these bloodthirsty creatures. And uh, carnivores are more apt to evolve strategies of overcoming uh, so that they may survive, and that leads to intelligence. Well, if you ask an evolutionist whether we come from the monkeys, he is pretty disgusted, because obviously we don't come from the monkeys. Our ancestor, the common ancestor, is the tree shrew, which is the one at the bottom over here. Now, the tree shrew has eyes on the sides of his head, and then over time it evolved so that the eyes move to the front. Now, this would uh, increase the triangulation and the accuracy of judging distance in terms of jumping. It's amazing, though, that the tree shrew never misses. It never misses a jump. So what the selective advantage in terms of jumping is, I wouldn't know. But uh, the movement of the eyes to the front enables the brain to increase in capacity. And so we came down from the trees where we had an arm-to-leg ratio of one to one and changed to an arm-to-leg ratio of three quarters to one. So the arms are shorter than the legs. Unless you're me, of course. I'm a bit of a misnomer, as you see. I must be an evolutionary relic of the past. Some would agree with that. Well, here we have the evolution of man. And please note that the apes, such as the gibbon, the orangutan, the human, the chimpanzee, and the gorillas, that they are all on the same level. This means that man did not evolve from the apes, but that all the apes, including man, had a common ancestor sometime in the past. This is very, very important. Now, it is also the case with all the fossil finds that we have. Modern man is contemporaneous with those, so what we have is not an, a paleontological sequence, but a morphological sequence. In other words, we have all the bones, and we say, what is the most logical way of putting them together in terms of evolutionary advance? So it comes, as Simpson said, out of the mind of the scientist and not the evidence of the fossils, however reasonable it might be logical, it might be reasonable, but it's not necessarily right. Our living relatives, this we find in the British Museum of Natural History, we belong to the ape family, so they say. And again, we have the depiction over here of all the present-day contemporaneous creatures with some common ancestor somewhere in the mists of time. And this is the looser fellow that everybody is wishing to find. Now, when you look at a gibbon, for example, it has a long snout. So, on terms of the evolutionary scale, probably removed from man. If you go to this creature, it's sort of in between. And when you come to these, then you have the flattened uh, faces, which more resemble ours. So now we're, we're heading to the philosopher stage. And uh, the gorilla, same sort of scenario. So uh, they would put us into this sort of category. Now when you go into the fossil assemblages, please note that man and these creatures were contemporaneous already. Then you must come up with possible linkages. Now here is one of them. This is the famous Australopithecines, which are sort of depicted as being intermediary in their anatomy. Please note that these Australopithecines have killed some creature over there. This is a typical museum exhibit. And uh, they've used clubs in order to do this. Now, isn't this strange? They come down from the trees where they were totally vegetarian, like the rest of the family, and now they've suddenly changed their diet. Isn't this fascinating? And... Uh, they're shown using tools, and this encouraged the brain's development. In their enthusiasm to prove this point, science has often made drastic mistakes. 
For example, in the case of Nebraska man, they had Nebraska man uh, with his kills cooking Mrs. Nebraska, Mr. Nebraska, all of these issues until they find the rest of the fossil, which, by the way, was based on a tooth, and it turned out to be a pig's tooth. So in their enthusiasm to prove their point, science has often overstepped the mark. In fact, they've even gone further than that in order to well, create their scenario, they have modified some of these fossils, like the famous pulled-down hoax, and uh, produced something that was not there in their enthusiasm. But science has progressed beyond that point, they say. And so today, we have the African scenario. We come from an African stock. That's the famous theory of the day. And so somewhere from the Australopithecines through the various Homos and Homo erectuses, we come to modern-day Homo sapiens. So the out-of-Africa theory is the most common today. Somewhere in uh, the African continent, on the African continent, some claim here in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia, man evolved. Some take it a little bit further down here into the south of Africa, to the Stackfontein Caves, roughly about there. And uh, they say the spread of Homo erectus began as much as 1.8 million years ago, and this is the out-of-Africa theory. But not all agree with the out-of-Africa theory, although it is the prominent one at the moment. So here you have the famous African uh, fossils down there at Stackfontein, and up here in the Ethiopian region where the Leakeys did their work. Uh, but you also have a multi-regional hypothesis, which is very fascinating to me. The regional populations of Homo erectus might have evolved into Homo sapiens while intermingling with one another, showing different populations all over the world. It's interesting that the textbooks have the point of origin here somewhere in uh, Asia Minor. Well, that's interesting because that's uh, where the Ark should have landed. Well, here is the famous leaky assemblage, where you go from Australopithecus up there through all the various homos down to Homo sapien. Now, please note that the name Pithecus means ape. Australopithecus means ape from Africa. So here we have this African ape. We have three types, Australopithecus robustus, which was the robust one. We have Afarensis, the one which comes from afar. And uh, these creatures lived here contemporaneously. So they have them classified as three species. It's interesting that some of them had a ridge across the skull and others not. But did you know that modern apes, the males, sometimes have ridges and the females don't? So that's not necessarily a criterion. Here in the Aldervai Gorge, they found tracks, tracks in stone. Now, obviously, these were made by the Australopithecines, so it is supposed. But man was there already. He was contemporaneous. He lived in the same region. So here in Aldervai, although you find Australopithecine skulls, you also find remnants of human populations. And there's no evidence that the footprints were made by anything other than humans, particularly since apes have an offset toe, which humans have, and the footprints depict more of a human nature than an ape nature. This is the famous skull in the Kenya Museum of one of these famous uh, Australopithecines. So that's the one line. Now, here are the Australopithecine skulls. All of them are ape. So there's nothing intermediary about them. They're either 100% ape, or they're 100% hominid. Here you have the hominid skulls, and uh, again, they're human with varieties, just like we have human varieties of skulls today. And uh, nobody would imagine classifying them any different in this time in which we live. This is uh, um, the famous Johansson, who was famous for the Lucy uh, discovery. And Lucy grabbed the world. In fact, this was one of the posters that was used in the International Lucy Day, where they had posters of this nature all over Europe. 
And you can see the dawn of intelligence in those eyes as she is evolving. This is a depiction in the British Museum. Is Lucy, Lucy more closely related to humans than other Australopithecines? Note the answer. This question is still unanswered, partly because each kind of Australopithecine has unique features that could link it with human beings. Now, isn't this amazing? Australopithecines are apes. They say we have so many remarkable resemblances to apes. And one of the most favorite ones, of course, is the similarity of the DNA. We share so many common genes. Well over 95% of the genes are in common. But these are only structural genes, not the controlling genes. And a tiny little percentage would make a huge difference. What if we shared 75% of the genes with a particular species? Would that make us related? Well, if it did so, we, we'd, be, we'd be related to the banana because we share 76% of those genes. So I'm not too enthralled by the similarity of the gene pools. Well, here we have all the Australopithecines using their tools. Note how they have advanced over time, how they are gathering wood and forming social groups. This is the famous Lucy skeleton. And Lucy is supposed to have been an intermediary, but there are so many gaps in this particular fossil. For example, the skull, which we find at the top there, is 100% ape. The arm-to-leg ratio is supposed to be midway between human and ape. But there are so many gaps, there are so many pieces missing in, in these arms and in these legs that how do you determine the ratio accurately? The hip is another feature which is often associated with uh, a hominid type structure, a more human relationship, although not with this particular hip. So it was conjectured that the hip was distorted. Well, if there's no other hip to compare it with, then how can you say it was distorted? This hip was an ape hip. The knee is the one feature that is more human-like than uh, you would generally find in apes, but then it was not found with a fossil. So how can you say that it, ex that it belonged to this fossil? So there is nothing about this fossil which is anything other than ape. And some refer, it, uh, refer to it as a pygmy chimp, which I believe is probably the case. Here are the famous Stackfontein caves. I went to visit them in uh, South Africa. This is the entrance to the cave. And it's a national heritage site. Outside is the statue of Broom. He was one of the early professors of my alma mater, where I did my undergraduate work. And uh, he was, of course, a very famous evolutionist. And he had many, many fans in high places, like Field Marshal Christian Smuts, who was Prime Minister of South Africa. He was a great evolutionist and uh, liked this philosophical stance. And here in the caves, we find these fragments of these ancient creatures together with many other animal fragments. Here are the, some of the stalactites and stalagmites in those famous caves. And uh, these are not uh, hominid fossils. These, this is my wife. And Francois Duplessis, who we see in uh, the introduction to these lectures, and he's pointing to bone fragments here embedded in the rock. Now, this is not a, a layer, as it were, where life evolved. This here is a washed-in material. So the material was washed in over time and represents whatever lived in that environment. Here's a close-up of all these bone fragments in these rock layers. Here we have uh, their own... Scenario, South African cave deposits contain bones of animals collected by many different agents. Some bones are washed in from the surface. Others are dropped down shafts by leopards, etc., hyenas, etc., etc. So these were washed in. Some would like us to believe, you, you know, these represent levels where we have the evolution of life depicted. No, this is not the case at all. We also find all these different animal skulls in those assemblages, so not only hominids, and they're all modern. This is the Robert Broom Museum at Sterkfontein. If you go inside, you have the famous Tuang child. 
Now again, notice the appearance of this child. It looks like a philosopher, right? Like a mathematician or perhaps a poet or something like that. The famous Mrs. Pless. Now, these fossils are again Australopithecines, which means they are 100% ape. Great excitement when the little foot was discovered in 1997. The world press was full of it, just as it is full of it whenever you find a toe fragment or a this fragment or a that fragment. Everybody gets excited. But what do we have? It's just another Australopithecian foot with an offset toe. So is there any evidence for the evolution of man here? Surely not. This is Dr. Ron Clark's little foot femur, which is on display in the museum. Some large tooth apeman fossils from Stackfontein, and they give the millions of years. These are ape deposits, 100% ape. When it comes to the hips, we find textbooks which show the evolutionary advance from narrow to broad hips, depicting the hominid line. That's not fair. Again, this is a morphological sequence. You take them and you put them down in the sequence that you want them to be, from narrow to large, to wide. Can we find the same today? Do some women have to go to the gynecologist and have to have caesarean sections because they have hips that are too narrow today? Yes or no? Obviously, yes. So to make a morphological sequence and then to claim that that is an evolutionary sequence is not fair science. What about Neanderthal man? Well, Neanderthal man has been found in grave deposits where they were ritually buried, some with even flowers. So what were they? They were humans, 100% humans. But in the textbooks, we have this primitive bias of these creatures that walk with a stoop, depicting their earlier uh, evolutionary advance. Now, this particular fossil that this type is based on was one that was found to have arthritis. And then it might have been very old, and bone structure changes with age. So this has nothing to do with uh, the appearance in terms of primitive bias. This has to do with age and disease. Isn't it a sad fact that not many years ago, these poor people were depicted as evolutionary relics? Today, they are scientists, professors at the university, nobody bats an eyelid. But just a half a century ago, or a little more than that, you could still buy a license to hunt these poor people because it was considered that they were on an evolutionary time scale less advanced than present day man. So the evolutionary idea leads to many horrendous crimes of humanity. These are 100% human individuals with the same capacities as any of us. The same dreams, the same love, the same emotions as we have, the same intelligence. And the environment in which they lived just had them living a primitive lifestyle, which today is as advanced as anyone else's. So you cannot use purely anatomical features to create a primitive bias. So let's have a look at uh, how life evolved. Here we have the Evolution Comes to Life series in Scientific American. They find a bone fragment, and then they say they use forensic science. This is not forensics. In forensics, you start with a whole skeleton and put it together and say what it looked like. Here you have a fragment, and you come up with a skull. Eventually, you come up with the flesh upon that skull. Eventually, you put down the skin, and then you put on the hair and the clothes and the stare and the expression in the eyes. Do you get that from a bone fragment? I doubt it. This is bias. Bias, however fair, based on the paradigm in the head of the one who reconstructs the creature. And so you will find anything from primitive to advanced. My question to you today is this. In Genesis 1 verse 27 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
Do we accept the word of God and say that there is no evidence for this evolutionary advance and we are in the image of God not to reflect his personality, his love, his watch care for each other and for, for the people on this planet? Or do we believe that our ancestor looked something like this? Well, I've put some different uh, races on the bottom here, and you will admit that these are considered some of the most beautiful women in the world. The variety that was available uh, in the gene pool made it possible for all the different varieties of man that are on this planet today. Choose thee this day whom you will believe. Either God, and if so, serve him, or science. We are all unique, isn't that so? Join us next time as we look at the bigger picture regarding the great diversity that we have on this planet in the lecture on the genes of Genesis. <laughs>